segment two. Welcome back to We Are Libertarians, episode number 307. I'm Chris Spangle, and here with me is Harry Price. Harry, how are you? Going good. Need more coffee now. And <laughs> you, need, you need to pick it up? <laughs> if you, Yeah, you're going to need it in this segment. If you haven't subscribed to our show, please do so now, and be sure to leave a rating and review while you're there. This segment is brought to you by our Patreon, which you can find at wearelibertarians.com. So in the news, we just uh, had last week. We talked about the death penalty. Uh, were you here for that episode when we talked about the death penalty? Mm -hmm. Okay, and we were talking about the the morality of it and uh, why it is uh, why libertarians don't believe in the death penalty. And sadly, we had an example of that take place in Tennessee when they executed Billy Ray Irk with drugs that inflicted torturous pain. And it was a pretty. I, I wouldn't say it was like a. Uh, what was the movie the the Green Mile? Yeah, uh, it didn't. It might have been a Green Mile situation. Maybe not as gruesome, but uh, definitely yeah. not not. I I would say it was cruel. Yeah, but not that not Green Mile's type. But it was still cruel of what happened. Yeah, right. Uh, so the Independent writes uh, in a story called Tennessee executes child killer Billy Ray Irk with drug that inflicts torturous pain. Tennessee has carried out its first execution in nearly a decade using a controversial cocktail of drugs, including a lethal ingredient described by the Supreme Court as chemically burning at the stake. Billy Ray Irk, an inmate convicted of the 1985 rape and murder of seven-year-old Paula Dyer, received a three-drug injection Thursday night after the Supreme Court denied a final request to stay his execution. The lethal injection consisted of... Med Medalazone. I should have looked how to how to uh, actually pronounce this. Uh, mid midazolam, yeah, midazolam. <laughs> That's how what we'll go with. Used as a sedative during an execution, a muscle relaxer called vericuronium bromide, and the compounded potassium chloride, the agent that stops the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, Billy Ray was on death row for 32 years. Now, I want to ask a series of questions because. Okay. You know, we, we talked in sort of generic terms last week, but we have a specific case here. And so for those of you who are not totally sold on the death penalty being made illegal uh, and ended by our society, I want to ask you a series of questions. And th those of you who are on the fence or even think like Harry and I do, it's always good to refresh what you think. Yeah. you got to water the tree of liberty from time to time. Mm -hmm. Test it out. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so... Here, here's one one question, uh, Harry. Do you think someone that is mentally ill should they be executed? No. Okay. Why do you say that? One, I think it's barbaric that we think we can get justice from taking the life of another human being. I think that idea is something that it's just more of the animalistic side of humanity something that we uh like a holdover from the you know like basically i'm gonna call it the dark ages just like slavery it was just a holdover like a thing that us as you know liberty oriented people or just people in the quote unquote western society could just do away with you don't get justice that way and especially if someone's not even if someone's mentally ill they're not really understanding what's happening to them. Right. So you're basically like the only way you could justify is like you could unperson someone and put someone down, but then no, even that that's makes you seem like more of an animal than than the thing you're trying to put down. Right. So Billy Ray Irk, uh, so Nashville Scene is a website where their uh, author, I, I wish I'd written down his name, but he he had a bunch of reporting and even went to the execution. But the Nashville scene has covered this a lot, and they wrote an article called Is Billy Ray Irk Fit for Execution? And kind of detailed his long history of mental illness. Um, he was six years old the first time someone qu raised questions about his mental health. It was March 1965 when he was in first grade. His school's principal referred to him, referred to him in 1965. Someone referred him to the Knoxville, Tennessee Mental Health Center. <laughs> I'm guessing the South in 1965 wasn't solid on uh, mental health, and uh, it probably the, as the you'll country see, wasn't even exactly right. I mean, it was like 15, 20 years before when the Kennedys had one of the girls lobotomized for God's sake. Yeah, exactly. Like you know, like they, you know, you probably could get someone you know put in a 
institution for just being gay in the 60s. Yeah. Um, so his extreme behavioral problems and unmanageability in school were the result of emotional problems, and, and they weren't sure if Billy suffered from some form of organic brain damage. A clinical social worker at the center performed an assessment, noting that the young boy apparently mistreats animals and had for a couple of years been telling people outside of the home that his mother mistreats him, that she ties him up with a rope and beats him. Later, a psychologist at the center who suffered, uh, who interviewed Irk concluded that he was mostly likely suffering from a severe neurotic anxiety reaction with a possibility of mild organic brain damage, uh, and he tended to fear his own impulses. Um, it's always scary when somebody's inside their own head and fears themselves. Yeah. Uh, so seven years after the evaluations, while 13, he was living at the Church of God Home for Children in Tennessee, a, a former orphanage that provided care for abused and emotionally disturbed children his parents who were mentally and emotionally st- uh, whose whose own mental and emotional stability had been questioned rarely visited him between the ages of 8 and 13 but in june 72 according to testimony included in court documents the facility arranged for irk to visit his parents at home that visit did not go well uh, billy used an axe to destroy the family television set club flowers In the flower bed, and in a very disturbing incident, used a razor to cut up the pajamas that his younger sister was wearing as she slept. Oh, wow. The razor was later found in the sister's bed. Um, So, in 86, the case of Ford Ford v. Wainwright in the Supreme Court ruled that executing an insane man, a quote-unquote insane inmate, runs afoul of the Eighth Amendment prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. How to determine whether a condemned inmate is insane, however was left mostly open to question. Uh, Justice Powell opined that it would be unconstitutional to execute an inmate who is unaware of the punishment they are about to suffer and why they are to suffer it. And that is the standard that has been used in many lower courts. Two more psychologists reviewed the affidavits uh, later in his trial uh, for for the murder of a seven-year-old girl. Um, that he suffered, at the very least, from a disassociative disorder and probably was schizophrenic or intermittently psychotic. Uh, Thursday night, after the Supreme Court denied a final request to stay his execution, he was put to death. The legal, the lethal injection... Uh, oh, I think I've read this part. Uh, in a brief... <laughs> uh, sorry about that. In a brief filed in 2010, Irk's attorney argued that he was experiencing a psychotic episode with hallucinations or delusions and that he had no memory of his role in them. Um, so, but uh, the state Supreme Court affirmed the trial court judge's uh, assessment that Irk was competent to be executed. So, clearly to me, it, it, I, I mean, it sounds like he's somebody who had clear mental issues mm-hmm. from the beginning of his of his life. Correct. And not just like docile, angry to the point that he was put somewhere else. Yeah. So that's I mean it's Yeah, he yeah, he seemed like he could cause harm to himself or others around him. Right. So you have to ask yourself I I I mean in general I would say that anybody that takes a life has probably got something going on, right? Yeah, depending on how they take the life, but yes, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, self-defense is different, but if you're if you're premeditated or if you're killing a seven-year-old Premed- girl. Yeah, premeditated killing a seven-year-old girl right. or a crime of passion, you know, these, these things. Yeah, yeah, there's different instances to it, yeah. So uh, the world, uh, here's what you learn over 15 years of being around politics. It's not politics where, like... You look at this and you go, he killed a seven-year-old girl, put him to death. Mm -hmm. That's politics. The law, though, (laughs) the reason the law exists is because let's examine little, every little incre, help me. (laughs) What? Intricle? Yes, intricle little thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm struggling. Um, you, You have to look at every little piece of this case. And examine, is he a candidate for this punishment? Because the punishment is so severe. And so the devil is always in the details. Mm-hmm. And there's also the aspect of, does he have enough money? <laughs> Go watch you know, any true crime documentary on Netflix, like The mm-hmm. Staircase. Right. And even money won't, won't help you if you're an innocent man. Um, so... I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> convic- o- okay. convicted, se- convicted sex offender Brock Turner's out. OJ's OJ's free. 
Yeah, OJ's free. He went to jail for stealing his own shit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not murdering two people. Yep. Um, and so... I, I, the the definition of uh, is it it's not so easy just to say to somebody like are you for or against murdering someone who is mentally ill because there's different shades of that it has to be case by case um but uh, go ahead I dis- disagree like murders just off the table unless they're violently attacking somebody but that's but that's sort of where i'm leading to is yeah. that because there's so much complexity and so many in incontri- in- Forget it. I'm not even going to say the word. Um, <laughs> Intricate little details. Intricate little details. Intricacies. I don't know why I cannot say this word tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been working nonstop on work and wall projects for like a month straight. Mm-hmm. And I, my voice is tired. You can hear. I'm just, I'm beat. Um, so <laughs> when you've got so many different variables the worst thing that could possibly happen is taking an innocent man's life Mm -hmm. and especially in our name so just take it off the table especially when as we discussed last week it's more expensive Mm -hmm. it's it's more harmful to the taxpayers right and it's more harmful to the people carrying out the execution yeah so there's just no there's no real reason to keep it other than the mob wants it. We've just always done it this way. Right. In my mind. This is the way it was done. We've always had slaves. Right. You know, this is what we do, you know. That yeah, that's why I call it it's like just you know, it's a you know, it, it's okay. It's 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 part of our barbaric past. We used to believe this would a great punishment for people or like it's supposed to stop people from committing crimes. Right. It doesn't. We 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 can do tests, we can figure it out, you know. No. No, the death penalty is not a deterrent to crimes. Right. So it is not a, a great punishment. Right. Neither is, you know, filing humans away and things, but you know, like let's first let's just stop killing people. Right. You know, can we do that? You know, especially considering like the uh, because of the the lot of cases no, uh, not, I don't know about this one, but like a lot of them are very integral that there could be something that is missed and you could end up killing an innocent person. Yeah. Which we've seen 130 exonerations since 1973 in the United States. Yeah. And a lot of people like point out, like, well, we've never executed someone that's innocent. Like, yeah, because there's the, because a lot of them was like, well, the appeal process is so long. If the appeal process was faster or like if they could just like, nope, you're getting put to death in that month. No, that number would be higher. Well, DNA started popping up in the 70s, so that's why there's been 130 exonerations. Um, So, how did he actually die? Uh, And I think the question here for folks is, what's your limit of cruel and unusual punishment? Let's take the legal standard of what the Constitution says, that, that, that we outlaw cruel and unusual punishment. Where where do you draw the line at cruel and unusual? You know, is it the firing squad and the electric chair no longer um, it's cruel? They're, they're cruel. They've been considered cruel, mm-hmm. so we don't do them anymore. Um, and lethal injection has always been seen, I think, in a mimetic sense amongst the populace that it's not cruel. It just puts you to sleep, and you're asleep. Because we put someone to sleep, and then we start their heart medically. Right. So here's how he died, and this is, from what I've researched, not an uncommon way for someone who dies of lethal injection to uh, to go out. Uh, again, from the Nashville scene, uh, a narrative article called The Execution of Billy Eric. Soon, Eric's eyes closed and he began to snore. Around seven minutes later, he came to conscious uh, came the consciousness check. Billy? Billy? According to the theory of this constantly litigated process, this check of consciousness is in place for prison officials to make sure that the condemned inmate is unconscious and supposedly spared the torture that would otherwise come next. But around two minutes later, Eric did appear to react physically to the second drug. He jolted and produced what sounded like a cough or a choking noise. He moved his head slightly and appeared to briefly strain his forearms against the restraints. In a statement following the execution, federal public defender Kelly Henry said those were the signs of the kind of trouble warned about in a lawsuit filed by more than 30 death row prisoners, including Eric. 
This means that the second and third drugs were administered even though Mr. Eric was not unconscious, she wrote. The state's descriptions also raised troubling questions about the state's attempt to mask the signs of consciousness, including by taping down his hands, which would have prevented the witnesses from observing the failure of the midazolam. Around 7.37 p.m., the color in Eric's face changed to almost purple. After that, we watched for nearly 10 minutes as he lay there. He did not appear to be breathing any longer. I saw Tennessee's death penalty in practice last night and watched as state officials killed a man in my name and in yours. They strapped him to a gurney and injected him with drugs, and we have every reason to believe uh, that they caused unimaginable pain. There appeared to be signs that he did feel something, but only briefly. Once the second drug, a paralytic, took effect, he was unable to move regardless. Did the state of Tennessee torture a man to death for thir Thursday night? I was in the room, and I suppose I couldn't say for sure. Uh, and I, as Hody Johns, on Sundays we're now putting all the topics in the Facebook group, uh, and you can comment with uh, stories and links. So join the Facebook group at WeAreLibertarians.com. And as Hody points out, you covered the death penalty in 305. You spoke to the element of trust in the government carrying out such a procedure. This now seems to also cast doubt on the government's ability to execute such a procedure. And I think that's totally true. Like, <laughs> we don't believe the government can do anything right. right. So we're now trusting uh, some DOC employees to administer three stages of death drugs correctly? Correct. Yeah. The the other thing that is taking place is that states uh, are having their drugs expire, and when they go to buy new ones, the companies are not selling them mm -hmm. anymore. Someone put that in the thread as well. I wish I could remember who who put that. I, I apologize. And so oh, yeah, I read that. I can't remember who posted that. So sure. Kansas just killed someone with fentanyl. Yeah, they literally put someone to death in the way that people are d dying on drug overdoses. Now. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not even the three stage process. They're just overdosing them on opioids and killing them. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah, which was like that was a crazy story, to talk, uh, especially with the drug manufacturer that does it. It's like no, no, no. We want to know who sold it to you because we wouldn't have sold it to you, right? We don't want our name or our drug anywhere near this thing, right? You know, because the one because one of the opioid crisis, right? That's already a right. bad you know term. No one wants to use their drug. Do they did design this thing as you know like as a painkiller or stuff like that? You know, this is what they want it to be used, not for the other uses that people have found for this thing. <laughs> Go ahead. And it's, uh, yeah, the, the, like going there is just like really creeped me out because I've, um, you know, I don't suffer from sleep paralysis, but I've had episodes of that mm -hmm. where you're up, you really can't move and all that. And that fear of up, can't move, and that pain and understanding that you can almost feel yourself dying. Right. That's, and you can't do anything about it. Granted, you know, like it's like, well, he's a killer. This is what he did to someone else. Yeah, but for, the state is doing that in your name to someone else. The the other point, the difference between Americanism and libertarianism mm -hmm. is that we don't craft governments to, to... The barbaric part of us says, do whatever we want to do to that person because they no longer have a right to exist. Right. That's what our ancestors thought. Mm-hmm. And then Americanism, you know, in the form of our founding, right, and which with heavy libertarian influence and people like John Locke, and, and then ultimately the the flourishing of libertarian thought in the twentieth century. Mm -hmm. The point is that you don't craft laws around what you want to do to somebody else. You craft laws as if you are that person, mm -hmm. and that's the, that's a very different way of thinking about the law and about policy. Because if you are this gentleman laying there, being put to death by the state, and God forbid you're innocent, mm -hmm. you get tortured on top of that. You know, even even though he is a murderer, that he t he did a horrendous act and he did a lot of bad things, he is still a human being worthy right. of dignity. Mm -hmm. And this is where I completely agree with the Pope. Yeah, and it's shocking to see that. I think it was like 75, over 75% of evangelical Christians agree with the death penalty. Yeah, pro-lifers. 49%, 52% of Catholics. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just have to say, like, this, the, y you as a Christian should want a person to live as long of a life to give them as much opportunity to repent of their sins, mm -hmm. to convert, 
to change their ways and to be a witness to other people. Say, I was this horrendous person and now I've changed. You know, there, th- there isn't um, any way... I mean, if you look at the the two thieves on the cross between Jesus or Barabbas the murderer, I mean, he always was treating the worst elements of his society mm-hmm. with the greatest love and empathy. Right. And so I don't know how you can look at that story and read that and go, as a Christian, I support that. Because that's you, they're your tax dollars, you're morally complicit in a person being tortured to death. And even though he is a horrend, he, he did a horrendous thing, which I sometimes think we we often say, you are judged by the worst thing that you ever did in your life. You were a murderer. Well, you committed an act, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean that your whole entire character. It, it is a pretense for throwing out the um, dignity and respect and love that people are 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 uh, that every person should have. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, and I get the idea of, like, warehousing them away from normal society, away from people, and restricting their freedom because they took a life. I get right. that. That I could get because yeah, I can't think of another is, system. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Yeah. And I think from a uh, from a personal perspective, you have to ask yourself, would you personally kill someone? And so this is always sort of my test with these issues is what, what would I personally do mm-hmm. if I were in this situation? Take away the fact that I'm a Department of Corrections official, Mm -hmm. and I legally have the right to put this person to death. Mm -hmm. Would I personally want to do that act? And the answer is no. I would rather the person be put into a cell for the rest of his life than me have to take his life. Because my personal morality, I don't think, is detached from what the government does. Hmm. Yeah. So... Um, so you have to think about what your definition of cruel and unusual punishment is. Uh, you know, this, the sedative in Tennessee's execution cocktail doesn't always render complete unconsciousness. It is possible for the inmate to feel the effects of the next two drugs. And what his, what he feels is akin to being suffocated and burned alive at the same time. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we would not put somebody at the stake Mm -hmm. or suffocate them to death with a bag over their head, Mm -hmm. but we're doing it chemically and somehow we make that, we make ourselves feel okay with that. Yeah. We're not crucifying people who sit there in Tennessee. Right. But they might as well just did that. That's basically what they've done. That's exactly right. So this one's quicker, quicker though. Yeah. Crucifixion would have took longer, but this keeps going to the Supreme Court. And uh, Sonia Sotomayor wrote a dissenting opinion in this particular case about Irk. Um, Although the medalism may temporarily render Irk unconscious, uh, the onset of pain and suffocation will rouse him. I mean, that makes total sense. Your natural biology is going to to awaken your fight or flight, even if you've been Mm -hmm. medicated. Uh, And it may do so just as the paralysis sets in, too late for him to alert bystanders that the execution has gone wrong. That the execution has gone horribly wrong, if predictably. In refusing to grant Irk a stay, the court today turns a blind eye to a proven likelihood that the state of Tennessee is on the verge of inflicting several minutes of torturous pain on an inmate in its custody, Sotomayor wrote. If the law permits this execution to go forward in spite of this horrific of the horrific final minutes that Irk may well experience, and did, then we have stopped being a civilized nation and accepted barbarism. Do you agree with her statement that we are accepting barbarism by enacting this practice? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which, agreeing with Sotomayor, I never (laughs) thought I'd do that. I (laughs) know. But, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It just... And just talking with people is like, wow, is this how the abolitionists used to feel? Talking about, like, hey, man, you know, they're humans, you know? Right. Let's not do this. Come on, we're better than this, right? It's a mighty big statement for you to say, considering your family's history. Uh, it's called growth, okay? okay? Okay. Leading into the future. Harry, lest you think I was a racist, Harry's family, he is descended from slave traders. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a joke. <laughs> um, Chief Justice Ear- Earl Warren once said uh, that in determining the uh, cruel and unusual punishment clause, each each generation should draw its meaning from 
evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. That was trope v. Dulles in 58. What happens if... <laughs> just a wacky thought, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy thought. What happens if our society starts to devolve mm. into more of an angry, barbarous society? I don't know. Bar, 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 bar. Right. Let's say there's roving rabbles of Twitter mobs everywhere, and mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. dissolve into angry people with uh, tiki torches on the street and, mm-hmm. and uh, bandanas mm-hmm. around our face, and then... Uh, I don't know. It's a very loose statement. Um, you get all Judge Dreddy. <laughs> so Scalia and Thomas, uh, and Thomas continues this today, but uh, obviously with Scalia passed, he's no longer uh, rendering judgments, basically said the standards of cruelty Difficult. to them were, what were the punishments in 17, what, were, what, was, uh, what was the standard of cruel and unusual punishment in 1791, and that is the standard from which we ought to operate. Which, a tar and feathered tax people. You know what tar and feathering is? Horrific. Horrific. Uh, burning people's skin off with tar. Yeah. Um, horrific. Hanging someone is horrific. <laughs> so uh, the the clause... The guillotine to, is horrific. In the con- strict uh, constitutionalist view, the clause prohibits only barbaric methods of punishment, not disproportionate punishments. A life sentence for a parking violation, for example, would not violate the Constitution, in their opinion. Uh, now, this is from the Constitution Center website, which is an amazing website uh, linked in our show notes. The cruel and unusual punishment clause does not prohibit the death penalty because capital punishment was permissible in 1971. Modern methods of punishment may violate the cruel and unusual punishments clause only if they are deliberately designed to inflict pain for pain's sake and are objectively harsher than the punishments permissible in 1791. I would also like to point out that in 1791, Harry could legally be my property. So maybe the standards of human dignity. That's, yeah. Not not we've evolved in the last 250 years. Yeah, please come on, come on. So we've moved on. You know, remember that's the same. Yeah, around that exact same time, remember the guillotine was coming into fashion for for in killing France, people. Yeah. Exactly. It's like oh look. I got this great thing. Kills people. It's completely painless. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, the, the there's a counter of point oh, on yeah. here. The Public appropriate executions. The, the, the there's a great Dan Carlin episode on uh, uh, hardcore history mm-hmm. uh, called Painfotainment that 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 if you're interested, you should go listen to. Um, the appropriate benchmark for determining whether a punishment is cruel and unusual is neither the subjective feelings of the current Supreme Court nor the outdated standards of 1791. Rather, the benchmark is long-standing prior practice. If a, give, a given punishment has been continuously used for a very long time, this is powerful evidence that multiple generations of Americans have considered it reasonable and just. This does not mean that any punishment that was once part of our tradition can still be used. If one's traditional punishment falls out of usage for several generations, it becomes unusual, and it is cruel to reintroduce it. Um, The clause prohibits disproportionate punishments as well as barbaric methods of punishment. If a punishment is significantly harsher than punishments traditionally given for the same uh, similar crimes, it is cruel and unusual. Um, For example, it would be cruel and unusual to impose a life sentence for a parking violation but not for murder. Uh, the death penalty is currently constitutional because it is a traditional punishment that has never fallen out of usage. Um, some punishment practices, such as legal lethal injection or long-term solitary confinement, appear to pose a risk of excessive physical or mental pain. If a court were to find that their effect is significantly harsher than the long-standing punishment practices they have replaced, uh, it could be appropriately found as cruel and unusual. So that is from your Supreme Court, a couple of opinions on how that would operate from a legal perspective mm-hmm. uh, amongst Amendment 8 of the United States Constitution. Harry? Uh, this leads into the other topic. Like, see, like, it's that type of reasoning that it's just that also leads into, like, the torture argument. And it's like, okay, so that's your line for just this crim- criminal. It's like, then that bleeds over to everything even torture that's right and so we'll we'll get into natural rights in the next segment in yeah. our path to libertarianism segment um so if you're just watching this segment on youtube make sure you go listen to the whole episode because we dovetail this into a, uh, a conversation on torture um but so why does this matter i think you have to ask yourself a few questions um 
Uh, Jay Lee Miller says, you know what's cruel and unusual punishment? I'm waiting to see what he says, and if it's anything other than this podcast, I'm firing him as a listener. Um, so, uh, Liberty Hangout's Facebook page. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Very good, Jay Lee. Um, so, why does it matter? As libertarians, aren't we all skeptical of the ability of every level of government to administer their own rules correctly? Every level. Every single level? Every level. And sometimes things are not applied appropriately. The rule of law is not is not fair and equal as it should be. And so, therefore, the ultimate penalty, the death penalty, robbing someone of their ability to be exonerated later and maybe have a few free years if they were innocent, in my mind, is just inappropriate and inexcusable as a citizen, as a taxpayer, and just as a plain human being who doesn't want the government doing things in their name that that is that they consider immoral. Right. Um, anyone in any any innocent person or tortured inmate is the result of voters and taxpayers allowing murder to take place. We are morally complicit. So you have to be completely comfortable with the way that this man died. Now, if you have listened to this and you read some of the links that we've posted in the last two show notes on three hundred five and three hundred seven. And you you have you have wrestled with the question, and you have come to the conclusion that he, he killed a seven year old girl, and whatever happens to him happens to him. I'm not going to shed any tears about it. I understand. I I I respect your decision. But if you are giving a knee jerk ad, ad hoc, just well, this is just what I think, as opposed to reasoning it out then mm-hmm. please re-examine your thought. I think you need to give every one of these major s- subjects deep thought and research. Mm-hmm. And I think you have to ask yourself if you would personally torture or mor- murder someone if they've committed a heinous act. Could you be the one pulling the switch? Right. And if you are not the one that is pulling the switch, then why do you want someone else doing it even though it's in your name? Yep. You, you, that's, that's not how it works. Yeah. So just a few things uh, to think about. I would also say libertarianism at its core is about empathy. And I want to give the worst amongst us the longest amounts of time possible to repent and change their ways. And uh, lastly, we should design our system as if we are the ones accused and not just part of the mob screaming at someone saying, do whatever to them. Yeah, Or at least anything just to study them. Right. You know. So, all right. So. Now we we are moving on, and uh, well, we're trying to move on. Nothing's happening, Harry. Dad. It's Mitten's fault. It? There we go. All right. So this uh, this segment was brought to you by our store. Let's be honest. Other than Jeffrey Tucker, libertarians do not dress well. Maybe Harry. We Are Libertarians has a solution. It is the new We Are Libertarians store. Get the shirt that men covet and women cannot resist now by clicking the link at wearelibertarians.com. Because Dear Leader is generous and thorough, we also have women's shirts. Don't forget to send us photos of yourself in your shirt to editor at wearelibertarians.com and we will post it. 